Welcome to the Co-Creative Sessions, your access point for knowledge and expertise from artists, creatives, change makers, designers, entrepreneurs, and community enthusiasts in the South Coast and beyond. It's just these little fleeting moments, which with photography, that's what we do, we stop time. Welcoming the viewer into what we do is just so important. How can you look at the different facets of your creative work? And now, the Co-Creative Sessions. Thank you for joining us for the latest entry in the Co-Creative Sessions. I'm Scott Bishop. I'll be moderating tonight's session. Matt Mignanelli received his BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence. His paintings have been exhibited extensively throughout the United States and internationally, and his work has been featured and reviewed in Interview, Art News, Vice, The San Francisco Examiner, NY Arts Magazine, Dazed and Confused, The Art Dossier, and many other publications. His work is held in the Distinguished Public Collections of the Estee Lauder Collection, New York, the Morgan Stanley Collection, New York, the Ernesto Esposito Collection, Naples, and the Red Bull Collection in London. And now, here's Matt. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dina, Scott, and Kyle, for having me. Um, it's a real honor to be here. Um, yeah, I think we'll just, um, I'll give a little overview, and then we can jump right in. Um, to the slides um, and go through, take a look at the works. Um, so I think tonight I'm just gonna focus on the latest works, uh, which are the blue paintings, which is a project I began in 2015. Um, and so at the moment, those works are, um, I mean, they've taken many iterations uh, on the same concept through the years. So I think we'll jump right in um, and start off with uh, 2015. The works um, have always existed at the at the intersection of the urban landscape and the natural world. Um, that's where this concept came from. Um, they're really influenced by light, shadow. Um, that's where this architectural element uh, originally came from. Um, and then it's kind of morphed and the idea of it has changed as a stand in for structure ever since. Um, and so, well, these works started, I was really cap trying to capture the movement um, in the city. There's this cast light, but uh, this painting was one of the first, um, and this was titled Union Square Fortrain. Um, and as you can see, these kind of vertical columns of shapes that exist within this grid. Uh, this was kind of representative of the motions of the two of the four tracks in that station. Um, it's not early on. I was more interested in taking um, a concept from the environment and exploring that. Whereas now, as I'll get it more into it, uh, the works have kind of changed more a search for uh, emotion and feeling, but. That was one of these. And so all of these, uh, the works are all created with, uh, they're all completely freehand. It's a, it's an, a water-based enamel on canvas. And, and we'll touch back into that as we go. Uh, these were three titled Rush Hour, one, two, and three from 2016 as well. Um, and so here I was really focused on the move, trying to create movement within the system. Um, it's always these, the, the parameters of this self-inflicted system has always been really fascinating to me. So I'm always pushing and pulling, um, within that. These are three works from 2018. This was an exhibition in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, and I was exploring these kind of splits. That's where the space, uh, more space started entering the works. And this is a, something I'm really still exploring, um, the works have become more and more minimal as they progressed. Um, and so here we had all the movement within that, within those parameters uh, just on one side. This was a painting titled Basque that was shown uh, at Christian Hjelgaard in Berlin in 2018. Um, and so the works have moved very slowly um, within the strict parameters. And I really love that. Um, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to make these small changes that really create 
a whole different environment, a viewing environment. So uh, these were three works uh, from a show at Denny Gallery in New York in 2018. Um, and so this is when more gesture started entering the works. Um, I was playing a lot more with this aqueous paint um, and just creating these kind of layers. So as the surface, um, you'll see a lot of the splash, the paintings really start to loosen up at this point. Um, so they're painted all flat on a table. And so as the brush returns many times back and forth to the paint, um, the hand just builds up these splashes organically. Um, and so that's where I started really getting looser and freer um, and allowing that chance to enter into the works a lot more. So then at the same time, that began happening on the right side of all of these, these works where uh, they just, I was letting the water and the pigment take its course uh, to create these kind of enigmatic environments. And here's a detail shot of that. Um, and you can see some of the brushwork started entering and that, that was, these were really the first works where that was present. This was a project uh, from 20, well, it, op it was in 2019. It opened and then it was up for two years throughout the pandemic. Um, and this was a site specific installation uh, up at Five Bryant Park in New York. Um, and this, the title of this was uh, Between Structure and Nature. Um, so it was a, it had, it was in conversation with the city and the park uh, that was right around the corner. And this was this diptych here that created this one larger work. So this was a really, uh, I mean, this really encapsulates my whole ethos, uh, which was a lot of fun. And so here's some other works of that installation. Uh, and then we had these five works that were on the other side of the, of the same lobby there. This work, so the, these works with their verticality, um, you know, as I'm thinking a lot at this point about the space within the city, um, the the verticality of the structure, um, and then the natural world present in the sky. Um, this was titled Washington Square Piano, Sun 2019, um, and this was this was referencing like this this winter light um, and this afternoon that we spent at Washington Square with the piano. Um, that was fantastic. And so here's some of the detail work of the underpainting. Um, at this point in the work, I started using, well, I guess I just, I'll jump back for a second. Um, so the materiality of the works has always been uh, the authenticity of the materials has always been extremely important to me. Um, so I, from the very beginning, I used a lot of industrial materials. I use house painting brushes. Um, and I started using these de these large uh, six inch decking brushes on a pole. Um, looking at the paint and the utilitarian use of paint throughout the city has always really fascinated me. Um, the kind of the doors that have been repainted hundred times, the railings, um, and just the his thinking of the history of how many hands have touched that um, through the process, the paint that's built up on those, and on all these sort of industrial surfaces. So I really wanted to bring the, an element of that into the work. Um, and so that's where I started building up these gestural uh, underpaintings that are done before the blue, um, just with the white underpainting with these decking brushes. Um, so we get quite a surface um, as this, as the blue is watered down, paint over, it settles within the cracks and crevices of the brush stroke and it really brings them forward. Um, so it kind of emphasizes these surfaces. And this was another one of those works uh, titled Off Kilter. So at this point, still investigating the movement um, throughout the works. 
in that kind of dichotomy with the natural world. So this was the beginning. So this was uh, 2019 um, when I, I started it shifting to this work. So this is more of the project. This is within the project that we're still working on now. Um, these more of these bands of shape. Um, and then this more, these kind of thinking about vistas in space. So in the same way that the grid, uh, I was using much more of a grid to translate the movement of the city and the structure of the city, how the city exists on that grid. I started thinking about these shapes more as just a language for structure. Um, and what I kind of mean by that was like these, just this, so these bands, the idea for these bands of shape came into being like by this looking out at a peninsula. So it was between uh, dissecting the ocean and the sky. Um, and so I really started playing with that kind of space. And I think as my life became fuller um, as a father, like the need for more space really entered the paintings. Um, I think it was this kind of shift. And yeah, so I, I started really pushing and pulling um, how, you know, how emotion could be translated into paint. And these kind of, uh, I see these works um, as very meditative and self-reflecting because when you're standing in front of these large surfaces of color, um, you're really forced to enter into them. Uh, and you're standing there with yourself. Um, that's it, you know, there's, it's kind of a surface of self-reflection. This kind of tension, these small shifts uh, in the band, changing your viewpoint, um, really changed the way that these works really felt. Um, this kind of like this upliftingness when it's on the, when the lighter space on the top and kind of all encompassing uh, when it was coming from when the darkest was coming from the top. And I really enjoy that kind of push and pull. So these, I was thinking a lot about, about light, um, these kind of different light sources. Um, and this one is more with the center, this horizon in the middle, so to speak, a more natural vantage point. These works, all of these were late 2020. Um, I had been working on a lot of watercolors um, throughout the pandemic. Um, I had been working on these concepts before uh, COVID. And um, yeah, I was, uh, I came back from quarantine and uh, did these. And yeah, I was looking back at these last night and I was thinking about, yeah, these are kind of, there's a level of hopefulness in these, I think. So here's some uh, studio shots. So how um, I included some studio shots towards the end here. Um, just so these works are made flat on the floor. You can see on the lower part of the screen there. So where the brush, this is also a, a pole brush and I use uh, different concentrations of the same paint. Um, so it's just still that blue enamel that's just watered down. So each work uh, is about, there's probably 75 coats of very thin washes. Um, so I started treating these uh, in the same way I was creating those watercolors. Here, there's this kind of expanse. Um, I shifted, I really liked that, shifted that structure to the bottom. Um, and I really like how these felt, they feel very grounded when I look at these. Um, and I liked how much of the uh, expansive space. These are all 2023 from here on out. Um, this is the newest work I'm working on. So gesture has entered a lot more into these um, in the past year and a half. I'm still working on the gradation works as well, but I started wanting to I started wanting to create these in a different way. I started thinking about these segmentations as bands of of time. Um, you know, 
it's like before I'm trying to visualize emotions um, through paint. And here I was thinking about how I could do that at the same time with encapsulate moments of time. Um, and so and I think, so that's where these kind of segmented works are. These kind of emotions are so fleeting. Um, and it was, I was trying to capture those moments. This was titled The Phantom of Life, which was actually from a Herman, was from Moby Dick. Yeah, and thinking about these different orientations, um, different segmentations in the work. Yeah, here's some detail works uh, from the studio. Um, so as you can see, painted flat, very gestural here. And so I guess talking about the materials a little more, um, that this, the geometric uh, bands are painted entirely freehand. I'll come, I'll lay down a uh, pencil line and measure it out, but it's painted with a small script liner, um, completely freehand. So these as well, um, the segments are completely freehand. And you can kind of see there's this wobble in the line um, where the house painting, where the house brush, uh, you know, really hits that line. It's pretty straight, but I love, I love the presence of the hand that makes sure that these are, you can really, you can see my hand in them. It's always been paramount to these. Um, I had pushed my work earlier on to a point of perfection uh, that made them seem almost like silk screened. Uh, the surfaces were pristine. Um, and so as I, once I reached that, side of things I came I started moving back um so I love I love that hand and that history of um there's a Frank Stella's black paintings uh where he has those lines you'll see the pencil line down the middle of the line and then he'll have the run the house painting brush on both sides leaving the negative space and those areas of paint just always invigorated me. So I was, I'm having a lot of fun with these lines. Yes, uh, so here's one, um, this is untitled still, um, that's a vertical split. Um, I'm kind of, I'm thinking back, it's kind of a merger of those, the concept of the earlier 50-50 splits. Um, I really like that these are, these are very human scale on uh, each side. And there's something very nice about that um and then just they have a completely different feeling um these aren't totally opaque you can kind of see in certain areas here um it's hard in the photo but so there is there's some depth to these um this is actually the newest work um and this you can see it's kind of sh so my sh i've changed the shape ever so slightly um, I'm feeling it's be, it's more successful in these. Um, it's compre it's compressed ever so slightly, um, and the smaller shapes on top have shifted from verticals to horizontals. And this will give you a little bit of an idea of the scale of these as well. Yeah, just a very close detail of that surface. This work is titled No Man is an Island. Uh, this, I started, I've been playing around. And I've made another body of work that's like this, where uh, the shape has totally come off the sides of the picture plane. Um, and the, thinking a lot about this negative space that surrounds these um, in an equal, equal amount uh it felt very nice the original idea of these i pushed and pulled them a bit but uh where this center piece this almost cut out of shape uh was at the same ratio of of the canvas itself and here's some details of the upper edge you can see the layers of washes that poured over the dark the darkest area is actually the last area they start from the lightest coat first and they're slowly built up. This is titled At Sea. Um, 
in thinking, you know, thinking a lot about the ocean is and that space. Water has played a very big role in these works. Um, and just this kind of compression of space um, that I've been thinking about with these kind of these more horizontal canvases. Yeah, and this is the final image here. Um, I'm curious about, first of all, I've loved listening to all of this. I know the pieces, but to hear it from you, the very detail is great. But I'm wondering in the last few ones, which comes first, naming the piece of work first and then producing it? Or does the name come afterwards, uh, particularly when you did No Man is an Island? Yeah, title always comes later for me. Later, okay. Yeah, always comes later for me. Dina asked, um, how does your environment uh, the environment your paintings are in impact the work? I don't think so much about, I mean, outside of the site-specific project at Bryan Park, I don't so much think about where they're shown in um, while they're being made. Um, I think, yeah, my my environment here in the city um, and the studio has influenced these works greatly. Um, I work in a pretty industrial area in Brooklyn. Um, and these kind of surfaces, these industrial surfaces are all around me. Um, and so that's really informed the work. Um, I think I felt that these works, um, they represent a real duality for me of my life because in the summertime, I'm up at the ocean uh, quite a bit and all the rest of the year, I'm in the city. Um, and so those, that has, that duality has really informed the work immensely. Um, and so I th I'm thinking more, much more about that. Um, I need that energy. Um, I, I draw quite a bit of energy from the city. Um, and yeah, this kind of balance uh, for me. There's been this kind of, um, you know, I think as, as much, it's funny, I think earlier on the, I mean, the whole concept for the works came from the environment. Now I think they're also much more self-reflective um, where I'm really search, I'm searching for this minimalism and purity in the work. Um, that's, that's really been my main, is my main driver currently. Um, yeah, it's this kind of, yeah, pursuit of purity and simplicity. Um, it's a way, it's a, it's a concept I embody in my life, um, but it's something that I'm searching for more in the paintings these days. Matt, I'm wondering, what's your process for developing a series? Because the scale, the shape, the design, you know, themes, things like that are all crucial and you can see sets of paintings pretty much the last painting informs the next um the i move pretty methodically through an idea um i, I move one at a time um through now sometimes two ideas will come at once i'll, I'll look at something and say wow that's interesting you know i'm good i'd like to see that a different way um when the idea comes, but usually I like to see one idea through to completion first and then move on to the next. Um, it's just, it's always been the way I've worked. Um, and these small shifts, you know, these, these very, they seem minute shifts in the work over the years as then when you look back on it, the work shifted immensely, but uh, that's kind of been the way that I move. Yeah, you know, I think and I move. I think what's really striking is there, they might be minute changes from painting to painting, but they're extremely striking when you look at the body of work, particularly when, you know, in some series, even just where the pattern is, where that block is, moving it or reorienting it has a tremendous impact. Is that something you're just feeling out? You go from one painting, like I have it here, thinking of what would happen if now, what if I placed it at the top? What if I placed it in the middle? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's just a, I've, I've always been fascinated by this kind of, by that tension that that creates, um, the complete emotional shift, uh, that 
comes from that, such a simple change. Um, I love that. Yeah. And so I really do kind of play around with that. I think I, I mean, of course I have, uh, I have preferences. I think, you know, I, I've, I've sh shifted to more wanting it on the bottom. Um, this kind of giving it the grounding feeling. Um, it has been very interesting to pull those off the bottom and kind of float them in the middle. And some of these, um, I'm working now on, uh, some bands of shape that are floating as well um which is kind of the next piece of the project for me um something that i was playing around with over the summer uh, and so there's some i'm happy with some of the paintings i've made some smaller ones since i've been back um that i feel are very successful so i'm, I'm moving to those now but yeah uh, the next question I had is, what are the creative advantages or opportunities when you start with these defined limits around pattern, around color choice? I think for me, it's a, um, the parameters, well, the parameters allow me uh, an immense focus. Uh, and I really, I love that. Um, it, it contains me in a way that I can push a concept as far as I feel I can take it. Um, I really enjoy that, that kind of the feeling of that organization. Um, yeah, I think that's the benefits of it for me. The, you know, the, um, earlier on, I was working in these very minimal works that were black on black, white on white. Um, and they sh slowly shifted here, but this this power of the monochrome and to have an um, and to be able to take an idea, it was a challenge for myself at first to just see how far I could t I could push an idea and not hide behind color, um, and that's where it started. Yeah, it's just this is kind of a, a challenge for myself, um, and now it's become much more of an ethos um it's uh yeah it's kind of that this organization that i live with um i dress monochrome um and so it's kind of like this whole idea it's a kind of a yeah it's a concept uh, well people talk about thinking outside the box and most of us don't even look through the whole box we're in and just it's fascinating to see these works because it's like here's the box I've created and you would think it's a limitation, but in fact, it seems incredibly freeing because now like I'm going to look at every corner of this box and I'm going to milk every bit of, you know, emotion and feeling and ideas out of yeah. these simple things. And then you realize you take simple parameters and you can do so much with it. And that's where I see the power in this work is there's like infinite variety, even though you have what seems like a real strict set of limitations. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel about it. Yeah. Oh, uh, Dina asks, what artists influence you? Uh, or what artists do you love? I absolutely, um, Frank Stella, who I mentioned, um, the, you know, the works from the 80s uh, were just really, you know, groundbreaking to me. Those cop, the copper paintings, the black paintings, the silver paintings. Um, Ellsworth Kelly has been a huge influence on my work um just his his way of thinking uh yeah the simplicity in that thinking i absolutely love um he's been um i think a lot about barnett newman um and the zips um specifically that li that line work um those fields of color i absolutely love um, and I think, uh, in more, more recently, I think I'm looking at Sean Scully a lot, those paintings, uh, I absolutely love, I think I find an affinity with him, uh, in that he works within a set of parameters. Um, they're not quite as strict as mine, uh but it's the same, same thinking. Um, and I really, 
I really love that. How important is the scale of the work, both for you as a painter and for viewers standing in front of it? Yes, important. Yeah. Um, I much like the work. I'm working in really three, only, well, four, three to four different sizes. Um, I work at 64 by 88, 72, 56, a 48, 36, and a 24, 18. Um, and the, so I've kind of, I'm very comfortable in that ratio. Um, I like that a lot. And, but with these, these environment, creating these environments, it, the at scale is extremely important. Um, you just are able to enter the work in a completely different way. Matt, is there anything else you want to share? I think that's about it. Um, if nobody has anything else. This has been tremendous because to see uh, a body of work and to hear you break it down in this way is really powerful. And I hope one of these days I get to stand in front of some of these pieces. Thanks for joining us for the co-creative sessions funded in part by the Akushnik, Dartmouth and New Bedford local cultural councils, local agencies, which are supported by the Mass Cultural Council, a state agency, and funded in part by two programs administered by the New Bedford Economic Development Council, Federal Award Number SLFRP1067, awarded to the City of New Bedford by the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and by the U.S. Small Business Administration, SBA, via the Community Navigator Program to support COVID-19 small business recovery. Stay tuned for upcoming sessions and view previous sessions in the series by visiting the Co-Creative Center's events page at cocreativenv.org. We look forward to seeing you at the next Co-Creative Session.